Well, in this series, we're talking about mission. We're talking about vision. We're talking about purpose. And you can summarize our mission in three key words, which we're breaking down. Last week, Parker, I thought they did a great job of talking about what it means to serve uh, Christ. And, and I got a lot of his message, but the one thing that stuck with me was that the best kind of serving is the serving that comes from the heart that's not contrived. It's something that is intrinsic within us. And so we've talked about worship. We talked about serving today. Let's look at this word grow. Now we need to be careful. We need to be careful with this word grow because we can't see growth as some form of a punch list, right? So what I mean is I worship this week, check. I did an hour in nursery, check. I went to Bible study this week, check. I gave some money to the church, check. Worship, serve, and grow, that's not a punch list. It's a state of being. It's, 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 it's intrinsic. It's who we are. I'm grateful because this has been a church where we're willing to be a part of the next growth initiative. And because of your vision, we keep growing both individually and as a church. But growth isn't easy. Growth comes with something we call pains. You've heard of that, right? Growing pains. Anybody? Yeah, you know. Like, for instance, uh, when you're young, did you ever have one of those moments where somebody told you, you better grow up? You got to grow up. You ever have? I was like 19 years old, and I'd been at the University of Nebraska for three semesters, and Apparently, I don't know, they have some minimum requirements to going to university. Things like, like actually going to class every day and, oh, I don't know, um, turning in homework. They, they're big on that. At least they used to be. And uh, paying your bill, they, they like it when you do that. So at semester, I went home. <clears throat> and uh, got, you know, I went home, I went back to Omaha, and, and then, you know, I was staying out late and hanging out with my buddies who apparently didn't have much to do either and sleeping in late and didn't have a job. And by the way, quite frankly, I'm not very proud of my years from like 18 to 20. There's a lot of stuff there that I won't go into. Apparently, neither was my dad. And so <clears throat> in February, he, he walked down into my bedroom. It was in the basement. My bedroom was in the basement. He walked down in the basement of my bedroom. It's probably like 10 in the, in the morning. Switched on the light. Said, you will get a job and you're moving out in a month. <laughs> Left. <laughs> That's good parenting, by the way. I'm saying it right? Yeah, look, you can give a standing O if you want. I don't know. But anyway, it is, that's because he basically he said to me, grow up. Man, it motivated me, okay? I'm just telling you. I, I, it got me going. Growing up is a good thing. Now, being a child, being childlike is a good thing. Childlike faith, childlike humor, that's a good thing. Playfulness, innocence, childlike innocence. Hold on to that as long as you can. But there is a lot of life that's better when you act like a grown-up. Relationships are better. Things get none, done that need to be done. Uh, people are more self-satisfied when they're acting mature, and the people who you are relating to tend to like that more when you're being mature. And so when you actually have to do things like take responsibility for your life and pay your own bills and pull your own weight, all these terms we like to use about being mature, and we say, boy, that's hard stuff. It's hard, but it's better. It's better. Maybe you become used to people, though, in churches who say, you know, there's absolutely nothing you can do to earn God's love, which, by the way, is 100% true. There is absolutely nothing. I, God loves me warts and all. And, and there is nothing that I can do to earn that. It's something that he did to earn that for me. He earned it for me. God loves me just as I am. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. What can happen is that we can confuse compassion with action. <clears throat> what I mean is we don't want anyone to think that, that to be loved by God, we have to buy it, we have to earn it, which is true. And we 
teach and we preach that here a lot because grace is free, forgiveness is free, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. But we can miss this. After we're born into a new life, Jesus wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. And so when you talk about things like, you know, being in a, in a setting where you're learning from other Christians, maybe a Bible study or a small group experience, we talk about things like, you know, having a personal devotional time, and we talk about things like, uh, I don't know, uh, doing some things to, to teach others in the local church. Those aren't just options on some church smorgasbord. They are essential to growth. And to be quite, you know, kind of silly about this, I think sometimes we, we, get, we, we do this. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, check. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and saved me from my sins and rose from the dead, check. I, I believe that uh, I need to worship Jesus with, with, my, with other Christians in the local church, check. Do I have to go every week or can I go twice a month? Um, if I have something I'd rather do, can, can someone else teach my kids' class for the next three weeks? Uh, can I negotiate the tithe from 10% to 4% if I work in the nursery once a month? What I mean is, there's this temptation to think, what do I have to do to continually earn God's favor? What do I, what's the minimum requirement? And that doesn't take into consideration that our goal in Christ is to grow. And so my first challenge to you in this missional statement of growth is, Jesus didn't call us just to be converts. He called me to be a disciple. Let's talk about that. In Matthew 28, a pretty common passage that many of you have learned. You could probably say it with me and and there's really nothing to guess with this verse. Jesus, as he is leaving us to prepare heaven for us, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and so it, the point is, our goal as a church is not to add members. Our goal is to make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is devoted to doing the lessons of the teacher. A disciple is a follower of the teacher. We are saved by grace, but growth is a process. It's messy. It comes with success. It comes with failure. The best kind of growing in life, I think, happens when we fail and learn from it and become better for it. In the New Testament, it, it's full of examples of growth. And, and by the way, I like how the New Testament uses this, orga this organic illustration of, of, of plant life to describe what growth is in the church and in the Christian. I think this is very intentional on God's part. And so like, for instance, in Hebrews, this is the core passage I want to look at today with you. It's in Hebrews chapters 5 and 6. And so the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who that was, but they're saying things like this to the churches in the first century. He says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In other words, you know what he's saying? You have stopped growing. You have stalemated. You stopped. Verse 12, in fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Yet you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, these are not pleasant, like, little nice things he's saying. They sound sweet and nice, but they're not. We love cute little babies. But not when you're wearing your diapers at 40 years old in a church. He didn't like this. It was like he's, throw, he's pulling them out of this thinking. You, anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves, kind of keep that in the recesses because we're going to talk about, trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings. Now here's what he says are elementary teachings that you should long now have moved past if you've been around the church for a while. These are the 
elementary things that we should be, these are second nature, right? That we shouldn't have to keep rediscovering in our life. Elementary teachings about Christ and being taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the acts that lead to death and of faith in God and instruction about baptism, about cleansing rites, laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. In other words, stop acting like babies. You need to transition from milk to big people food, grow up. That's the point. He's, that's the point he's making. You can't act like kids forever. Now, now know this. I think you know this. A child, if a child is not growing, there's something wrong. So if you have a six-month-old, a, a, a year-old child, and, and they're, you know, they stop growing, their, their size stays the same, their weight stays the same, you're freaking out. You know, you're, you're, you're turning over every medical rock available to figure out what's wrong with my kid. As a matter of fact, you know, the thing is, it could be genetic, but it also could be nutrition, right? And so you're going to feel, that child's healthy right there. Healthy lungs. <laughs> growing. Expanding the lungs. Expanding. Healthy. Anyway, can't ignore that moment, right? So anyway... You're going to figure it out. For the Christian, it's never genetic. It's always nutritious. She needs a bob. It's not about genetics there. It's just baba. That's all that takes. Sorry, you had to be my illustration at church. I hope you didn't take it. Jesus tells this parable in Matthew 13 about the tiniest seeds, the mustard seed. He says, okay, so you, gra- you, you put the seed in the ground and everything works and it grows up to be a big tree and then great things in the environment occur. Birds get a nest in it, it becomes shade. That's what it's supposed to work like. It's supposed to work like that in the church. It's supposed to work like that in the Christian. That's the way God wants it. Grow is what it means to be a disciple. Now, there are a lot of ways that we grow and things that make us grow, but there's one core part of this that every one of us has to grasp. I have to do something. I have to do something. The word do makes some Christians itchy. For some, it invigorates the faith versus works debate that's been raging in the church since Augustine in the 400 A.D. period, brought it up and started making it an issue. Out of our desire to help people to come to Jesus, we say, well, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation, which is absolutely true. But God doesn't love you because you're lovable. And so the the point is, he loves you, and so therefore, he is love. But that doesn't mean there's nothing I can do to cause my spiritual growth. There's a lot I can do to grow. I think those are two different things. And to be honest with ourselves, and we know this, we can't change ourselves by ourselves. We are not made to be self-made. We are made to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And to be conformed to his image and to put myself under his leadership, I have to be teachable. I have to be willing to grow. Think about it this way. I'm not a sailor. I, I don't, I've been on a sailor boat, a, a, sail, a sailboat with, with my friend Craig Sharon. He, is a, he, he, he does sail, sailboats. But I, have no, I don't have the first clue. I'm, I'm, I'm dangerous on a boat like that. I mean, I'm in the way all the time. But I do get it. I understand it. I understand the principle of the sailboat. When it comes to discipleship, I'm like a sailboat. Now, here's a question for you. Let's see if you're listening. What does a sailboat require? Now, we know it needs a sail. But what is it that moves or propels a sailboat? What is it? Wind. The youngest guy in the room knew it right there. Wind. Wind. Okay, that's, that's what discipleship's like. For the sailboat to go, 
I have to lift the sail. There's some controlling of the sail that is my responsibility, but it's the Holy Spirit that moves me. That's where the power behind the boat comes. I have to be teachable. I have to be willing to grow. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 6. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, see, that's me lifting the sail, I will show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on the rock. When the, when the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but it could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them in practice is like the man who doesn't put his sail up. He is like the man who builds his house on the ground without a foundation, and the moment the bad weather hits that house, it collapses, and destruction is complete. It's easy to come to church. It's easy. It's easy to come to church and hear God's word. Those two things are easy, to come to church and hear God's word. But the hard part is to put them into practice. And if growth is going to happen, I have to what? Do what he says. Now, let's be honest. Most of us don't do what we're supposed to do or what we need to do naturally. It's not a natural. I don't eat lettuce and celery every day because I naturally want to do that. I don't. It takes effort for me to exercise regularly. I I, it's a struggle for me every day to get out and do that. Because it takes time, it takes energy. Most of us don't just ooze with, with enthusiasm about eating celery and walking every day or whatever you do to stay in shape. But, but here's something that, that we need to know about that. We do that because of reward, there are good things that come from that kind of thing. Jesus uses the idea of reward rather than forced. Any of you Scott, Fo Scott Frost fans? Anyone? Scotty Frost? Anyone? Come on, you all are. Come on, come on. You know you are. The guy's great. He's, at least for now, until he loses a game. He's awesome. <laughs> they won yesterday. Did you see that? <laughs> they were incredible. They won the game. Anyway. I like a lot of the things Scott Frost says. So one of the things I heard him say, I've heard him say it several times, by the way, because they talked about his philosophy of being a coach and his coaching staff. And he says, you know, we don't coach out of fear. We coach out of love. We love our players. We encourage them. We think that's the best way that they can be taught. In other words, we coach for reward, not by punishment. And I think that's the best way. I think that's the way God teaches us. In many, many places, our Lord and teacher explains to us that there are rewards that come from growing. Like, for instance, he said the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. So there's a reward to look forward to. He said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? In other words, he's saying the reward is, if you'll follow me, you're going to get everything in the end. The reward concept from Jesus is very clear. Paul says in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, when the Spirit of the Lord is alive in you, you get experiences. You get rewards like love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. That's the kind of life that's, that's worth something. That's the byproduct of growth behavior. So we, we have to choose to grow. That is your choice. I cannot make you grow. God will not make you grow, for that matter. You, you will choose whether or not to do that. So how do we do that? I would say the best way, this goes back to something I told you to kind of circle in your mind, we grow by training instead of trying. Now, let me explain that. I, I know you can't really tell by looking at me but I'm not a runner. <laughs> Why are you laughing about that? I mean, I, mean, I know, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to be a runner. I have no interest. But if I did want to run, if I did want to run a 10K, I don't. But if I did, and believe me, I don't. But if I, if, 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 if I wanted to run, 
I, my only option wouldn't be trying. It would be training. Because if I just tried, I would die. <laughs> or something like that. No, if I had any chance or any hope of finishing a race without dying, I would have to train. I might survive if I trained. There's a real problem with thinking that I just have to try harder. It creates guilt. And when I feel guilt, I usually don't change. I usually get stuck. It gets me to tend to want to give myself over to the patterns that got me in trouble in the first place. There's this reliable and trustworthy way to grow, and it's, it's been around since humankind has been around. And it's not guilt. It's repeated behavior. We call them habits. And you have bad habits or you have good habits. God knows how you're made. And when you do something repeatedly, you grow from it one way or another. So change doesn't happen by wish. It happens by behavior that's lived out. It happens by habits. Take pride, for instance. Okay, I I read about a man recently who, by all practical appearances, was a pillar of his community, his workplace, and his local church. He was on committees at his church, his family very active there, his kids had now grown up and moved off. They were actually active in their churches as well as they took off in their life. So the guy had it going on, good, good guy at work, all that. Comes home one day, walks into the bedroom, his wife's not around, walks into the bedroom, there's a note on the bureau that says, I'm leaving. That's it. He's devastated, just tore him up, devastated. So, you know, of course, he tried to find her and finally found out where she was. And, 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 and he said, what, what's going on here? And, and she, he could only get this out of her. This is all she would say. She said, well, you know everything. I'm sure you'll figure it out. And he didn't know what she was talking about. And so, I mean, it just, of course, it ate him up. He's trying to figure this out. And so he thought about it, and he started reading the Bible, and, and uh, he kept leading him to this word pride. And so during that time, he uh, let God write a message on his heart. And so for two years, he was separated from his wife, and he realized that not only was his pride keeping him from a good relationship with her, it was keeping her, him from a good relationship with his kids, Found out that the people at church didn't think he was all that great either at times because of the way he treated people in meetings and, and uh, with his arrogance. And uh, even at work, he kind of leaned in there and figured out that people were afraid of him. He didn't know that because he always had to get the last word. He always had to be right. He always had to be the one who made the decision. He always had to have his way. Now, what would you do with that if you were him? Maybe you are him. What would you do with that? Here's what he did. He started memorizing verses about humility, about how to forgive, how to speak the truth in love, learning what love is and what it really looks like. He came to to know how God gave up everything to love us. And in short, he owned his teacher's modeling and discipleship about himself. And then he repented of pride. And he didn't run from community. As a matter of fact, he joined a different men's group. And he asked those men to keep him accountable and to pray with him. And he learned how to think differently and how to act accordingly. And then he started reaching out to his wife and he wooed her back. And he started dating her. And she saw a tremendous difference in him and they renewed their vows in 2014. And they're happy. Because he's different. And it wasn't just a couple apologies and attempts to try. It wasn't just doing what he had to do to appease his wife. It was a process of growth that took years and tears and a lot of effort. And the sin that had consumed him for most of his life was eradicated to a great extent because he grew. And I'll tell you what, this is the saddest part about most people's lives. They just won't do that. They just won't grow. That's it. Just trying is the outside-in approach. Training changes you from the inside out. 
So I, I just want to tell you about something that we're going to have communion together. And you've already been hearing a little bit about this. If you've been around here, maybe a little confused by it. And I'm not going to give you all the answers today. There's no reason to. But we're doing a pilot group of something we're calling Rooted. It's called Rooted. We didn't invent the name. Somebody else did. Rooted is an 11-week discipleship process that helps people get in a rhythm of healthy spiritual growth. And the reason why I'm so excited about Rooted, there's many reasons actually, but one of the reasons I'm so excited about Rooted is because in my 30 years, my 37 years of church ministry, it's really the best approach I've ever experienced in helping a Christian grow wherever they might be at that time of their growth span of Christianity. And I've been through Rooted. It's a life-changing experience. And it gives practical help. It, It teaches the rhythms that God has used for thousands of years to help people grow in their faith and in their in their discipleship. And we're going to open up Rooted in the fall to our church family, to the whole church. And if you want to get a preview of what that looks like, go to our website, go under the tab Next Steps, and then you'll see something that says Rooted, and you can just read a little bit about it. It's not very much there. And then file that away, because we're going to challenge every one of you uh, to take Rooted, to be a part of that. So we're going to pray, we're going to have communion. I'm going to come back and finish this message up after communion and offering. Lord, thanks for loving us and for doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. It's not our unlimited love that earns anything from you. It's your unlimited love that purchased us back through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and his life that's been infused into us through his sacrifice. So we celebrate that on the Lord's Supper today as we remember the price you paid to love us so dearly. And Lord, in return, our hearts come back to you out of gratitude and love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I just, a lot of ways I could finish this message out, but let's just suppose that your Heavenly Father walked into your room today, and you know, you've been sleeping in a little bit, and he said, I need you to grow up. What would, what would that mean for you? What what kind of, you know, all these, all these metaphors I'm throwing at you. What if, what if you raise the sail today? What would that, where would that take you? Would it take you away from something because it's been hurting you, hurting others, some behavior, some lifestyle that's wrecking your life and maybe take you to a, a more preferred life? Would it take you into some discipline that you've been putting aside, something like, you know, Bible study? You just haven't been doing it. You used to do it, but you don't anymore. Or you don't pray anymore. You gave up on that because you weren't getting the results you wanted and you gave up. Maybe it's fellowship with some group of people that are really good for you, but you just got lazy about it. I don't know. And so I would just ask you to raise the sail and I would ask you to listen to your Heavenly Father who wants to get you a message. And uh, there's a lot of things you can do, but the fact is it's all about rhythm. It's about letting God put you in a situation where you're growing. That's not perfect and it's not easy, but it's it's good. It's really good. It's an organic way to be. And organic is good when it comes to Christianity, just like organic is good when you live your life. And so I would also, again, I want to challenge you to put rooted on the, you know, on the, on the, at the back of your mind and on the top of your list, because when we open up rooted, I'm praying that many, many of you will take that challenge because it'll help you find a growth rhythm. If you're new here today, we have a place called The Hub. There's one located at this exit, out at the main exit. And if you're new here, do us a favor, stop in and say hi and let us know that you came. God bless you.